write-ups. You know, the alchemists wrote down what they did. And a lot of that information has been lost. So a lot of what we know about Maria comes down just by oral tradition. There was an Egyptian alchemist named Zosimos who lived probably at least 100, maybe as many as 300 years after Maria. And he told the stories of her from what you could gather in terms of the oral traditions of the day. So unfortunately, not only has some of the detail about her life been lost, but we can assume as much as we know that she did, she probably did so much more and it's been lost. So a little bit about her life. Well, she founded a really important school of alchemy in Egypt that actually persisted for quite some time and was responsible for carrying on some of the stories, though they probably grew in magnitude and grandeur as the years went by, but the stories of what she did. And she was probably just a little bit after Euclid's time, probably lived around the same time as Archimedes, might even have known him. There is some evidence of that. So some pretty honest company for her. Zosimos referred to her as the sister of Moses, or Miriam, which was, which is supposedly the sister of Moses. He referred to her that way probably because she was so wise. In all likelihood, she was not, or rather there is no evidence that she was of the lineage of Moses. But it was the best he could do to give her a sort of nobility as he talked about her in his writings. The Jewish name actually came directly out of the reference to her as a sister of Moses. And again, this is legends grow with time. And so he referred to her as the sister of Moses as a sign of respect. And then people said, well, Miriam's a Jewish name, so she must be a Jew. And it kind of went on from there. But there's no evidence to back up that any of this is actually, you know, that there's a genetic age there. Her work and her inventions she did a bunch of things. Some of them were fairly typical for the time. Some of them were very atypical. Some of them seem not too exciting for us when we look at them right now. For example, uh, she worked on sulfur compounds and developed a process for making silver sulfide. Now, that may not seem incredibly exciting to us now. But what we have to remember when we look at this is the fact that it made her incredibly unique among her sort of cohort of the day. The other alchemists at the time didn't care about sulfur compounds or silver sulfide, which incidentally is uh, still used today by metal workers. It's referred to as yellow, and it lays a black uh, tarnish on metal work. So it's an important compound. But the alchemists at the time would have thought it was sort of a laughable pursuit, something really beneath an alchemist who should be worried about eternal life and getting rich. She wrote a book called the Maria Practica, and that book was actually used for, depending on when exactly she lived, anywhere from 1300 to 1600 years after her death. So that is a textbook that went through a number of editions. <laughs> That's a very long publication history. She invented a lot of stuff. And so while she has a lot of meaning for metal workers in terms of having developed the silver sulfide process, where most people sort of see, I guess, even if we don't recognize that we see her influence, is when we work in a chemistry lab, if you took high school chemistry, if you took college chemistry, the distillation apparatus that you used to separate one substance from another would have been an invention of hers. She invented this interesting little three-armed distillation still that was used all the way up until the 18th century when it was finally replaced by something else. And actually, she, was, uh, she really knew her way around the kitchen because what she figured out, a big problem with distillation stills is they have to be sealed tightly. And we have all kinds of ways for doing that now, different kinds of greases that don't react. You have to use something that can steal the still without actually reacting chemically. And she thought and thought, and she said to herself, hey, when you mix flour and water and let it dry, it makes like glue that really barely reacts with anything. Why don't I try rubbing that stuff on the joints of the still? And she did, and that was a trick that was used for centuries thereafter. She invented this little guy here, Herotakis, 
which she used as a very high temperature double boiler, but which actually led to the design for the double boiler that if you've made candy, you've used in your kitchen to this day. A double boiler is a really convenient kitchen tool, as well as a convenient lab tool. The reason being, and again, you know this if you've tried to make candy, You've got to keep your candy at really constant temperature. If it gets too hot or cools down too much, it's going to either burn or it's not going to crystallize properly. And so what you need is a setup where you don't burn it, but you keep it at a constant high temperature. And by boiling water in one pan and allowing the steam, which is always at the same temperature in the case of water steam, always 100 degrees Celsius, allowing it to condense on the bottom of the second pan where you have your candy, as long as you keep that water boiling, doesn't matter what the temperature does under the water, the steam is going to keep your candy at exactly the same temperature. Now she used this both for reactions that needed to run at a boiling water temperature, but also she would sometimes put metals and salts and things like that in the bottom compartment because they would boil at a much higher temperature and she could make a very high temperature double boiler to run very, very precise chemical reactions at high temperature. Something we still struggle with in the lab today. To this day, it can be a challenge to keep a high temperature reaction running at a constant temperature throughout. Anyone who speaks French will have, well, anyone who speaks French and did any cooking will have heard actually the legacy of Maria in the name of the double boiler in French. It's called, and I apologize for my pronunciation, the Bain Marie. Maria's bath. Right? She was the first to learn to prepare a compound called Caput Mortuum, a purple dye, still used in painting today. And she invented a whole lot of glassware, a couple examples here, various stills, um, various containers that could be used for isolating one substance from another. So she was incredible in that if she wanted to do something, she didn't let the lack of equipment stand in her way. She was perfectly happy to put down her chemicals, go to the kitchen and find something that would help her, go out and make something that would help her create the equipment she needed to get done what she needed to get done. <coughs> There's even some suggestion that she may have been the one who discovered hydrochloric acid, HCl, which is the acid that we use in pools now to a certain extent. Now, Maria, like a lot of the alchemists, uh, she kind of speak in, well, let's say she spoke cryptically. The alchemists were so mystical, in a sense, and they were so tied in with trying to understand the universe in the context of magic or in the context of religion, that they were always treading with maybe one foot in the realm of what could be considered sorcery or heresy. So they had to be very, very careful, and as a result, they tended to encrypt their documents, not to keep their work secret from one another. They weren't trying to keep their inventions secret. They were just trying to stay under the radar of anybody who might consider their doings uh, not on level, okay? And Maria was no different. Because she tended to speak in these very cryptic phrases, we don't know necessarily whether some of the things that we have in the, the written and the oral history are things that she actually said and meant them literally or if they were some kind of a code. But one of the things that she's supposed to have said is, join the male and the female and you will find what is sock. Now, well, who knows what that means, but it was actually picked <laughs> up by Carl Jung who used it as a representation of the unity of male and female. And she then also said, and again, this is a who knows what this means, one becomes two, two becomes three, out of the third comes the one as the fourth. Whatever. <laughs> 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 the axiom of Maria, but once again, Jung picked it up and used it to explain and explore the dichotomy of wholeness versus individuation. And so the process of a child separating itself psychologically from the parents and things like that. And so her legacy persists even outside chemistry. <coughs> now, one of the things before we move 
on here that I want to say about Maria that I've kind of alluded to is that not only was she not really quite an alchemist in the sense that she didn't really care so much about the things the other alchemists cared about. She was doing her own thing. She was interested in physical substances and what they really did, not what we could maybe get them to do if we could invent something that would help us find something that would help us become immortal or whatever. She was worried about how this chemical would happen. And she was also an engineer. She developed the tools she needed in order to complete the experiment she wanted to complete. So in many, many ways, she was <coughs> the first modern chemist. And in many ways, she avoided 